So how often do you, you said part of the time you're, you're in Florida, part of the time you're in Colorado, how often do you make it back to Tennessee? And when you come home, what are some of your favorite spots here? Well, you know, we come back to Tennessee because we've got grandbabies and we want to go see the grandkids and then my children live there. And uh, that's where we focus our time and energy when we're back. Um, riding wise, I, you know, we'll do a lot of riding in Colorado and uh, anywhere the mood strikes me, really. Where's the, speaking of that, that makes me think, where's the strangest place you've come up with a song idea? Mm, that's a tough one. I've been in some strange places. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I, I've, I've got a lot of airplanes. Uh, I wrote uh, Nobody in His Right Mind on, a, on an Airplane. And uh, borrowed a napkin from the stewardess and a pen and wrote the song on the plane. Uh, got in that night, it was late. Went to bed, got up the next morning and wrote this melody. And with a chord I'd never played in my life before. And uh, I, I stumbled on it and, and uh, wound up with a great song. That's very cool, very cool. So they go, they kind of come to you whenever. Mm -hmm. yep. Probably the best way to do it. Um, when you, do your kids live in the Nashville area or do you ever make it back to East Tennessee? Do you come back to Lake Tennessee? Oh yeah, I've got, fam I've got family uncles, aunts in East Tennessee that I still go back to. Um, my mom's house is still there. We still visit that. And, and uh, yeah, I get back there probably three or four times a year. Oh, so you come back pretty often. Yeah, oh. I do. Well, you got to stop by the, got to stop by the news station one of these days and, and take a tour. We live in a, we, we live in a castle here. That's awesome. <laughs> that is, that's wonderful. Well, how, I, long, I how long have you been in that castle? Oh, you know, I'm not sure. You know, I only started working here about three months ago, so I'm not super familiar with the, the history of WATE, but um, I'm, I know we've been in here quite some time. Mm -hmm. Seems like I knew that for some yeah, reason. The, the Greystone Mansion, that's what the building is called. Oh, it's, yeah. It's pretty yeah. neat. They say it's haunted. Yeah, they, they've been there. ATE's been there a long time. Yeah, I think so. That's that's what I hear. Well, I've got some uh, some co-workers who would absolutely swoon over you. <laughs> well, don't swoon too much. <laughs> hey, congratulations on the Country Music Hall of Fame. That's a big deal. Man, unbelievable. Probably the most exciting and humbling thing that's ever happened to me. Just incredible when you look at all the people on the, hanging on the Wild Country Music Hall of Fame. It's just incredible. It just is. Yeah. That's that's so cool. Have you been inducted actually yet, or has it has mm -hmm. the event happened? No, because of COVID, we they've had yeah. to put it off, and and it's the last word I got that we were going to do it sometime in February, hopefully. So. We'll see. Golly, so you went from Jim Clayton Star Time to the Country Music Hall of Fame. So I was not alive when Star Time was on, but I hear it aired on my station on WATE, and I've only heard about this thing. You got to tell me about this. <laughs> what was what was Star Time, and what was your experience with it? Uh, on the Jim Clayton Star Time. Yep. You know, I, I entered a talent contest when I, I think I was 16, 15 uh, at the TV a and I Fair. And it came down to me and a flaming baton twirler. This is no lie. And she, and she threw her baton up in the air and dropped her baton and I won. <laughs> and oddly enough, the judge in that uh, was a, artist, singer, artist named uh, Wild Bill Emerson. And uh, like I said, I won the talent show and and first prize was a guest appearance on Jim Clayton Star Time. And as we all know, Jim Clayton uh, owns Clayton Mobile Homes. And uh, it was a, 
it came on Friday nights at like seven o'clock and, and they advertised the mobile homes. Well, they had a band called the country Kings on that show and they did all the backup for everybody. And I, I did my guest appearance on the show and they called me, we taped on Fridays and they called me on Monday and asked me to be a regular on the show. So I did that for a couple of years in high school. It was, uh, you know, honestly, one of the greatest things that could ever happen to anybody as far as I was concerned, because it, you know, it exposed me to a stage with a band and uh, it, it was just a wonderful, wonderful uh, jump start to my career. That is so neat. So now, I mean, this is, this is just super cool. You went from that to being inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame. That's got to be quite the incredible uh, a moment of reflection. What was your reaction when you found out you were going to be inducted? I was speechless for about two minutes. You know, I could, they, they called me under the premise that they were going to do a spotlight special for the CMA in their magazine. And then when she told me that really wasn't why they wanted to talk to me, it was because I had been inducted into Country Music Hall of Fame. I could, I was speechless, you know, I was floored. You know, never in my wildest dreams did I ever think about something like that. But I will say this, you know, it's all I've done all my life. You know, I got my first guitar when I was seven years old. I think I played my first talent show when I was eight. And, uh, you know, started writing songs that young too. And, um, you know, when I got out of high school, um, I hitchhiked, I, I walked up the entrance ramp at Oak Ridge Gallagher View on I-40 and stuck out my thumb and uh, got a ride with a hippie in an 066 Chevy station wagon full of marijuana. I'll never forget it. And he said, do you smoke pot? And I was like, duh. And he opened the, the back gate of that car and I'm like, oh, this is gonna be good or this could be really, really bad. But we made it and, uh, you know, I didn't really know a soul when I got there. Uh, started beating on doors, walking 16th and 17th, which was Music Row and uh, beating on doors, seeing if anybody listened to my songs. Well, it, it, it certainly did work out. You know, what's funny. I was going to ask you if you remembered that car ride. I knew I'd, I'd watched your documentary, which was fantastic, by the way. And um, when I was watching that, I thought to myself, I wonder if he remembers who picked him up when he when he uh, was hitchhiking, hitchhiking to Nashville. So uh, I don't remember the guy per se, but I, I remember him vaguely. But I remember I remember more about the car than anything. <laughs> And then you said you got your first guitar when you were seven. Who gave it to you? My mama bought it for me for my birthday. Did she, she knew you wanted to be into music? She knew you were into music? Oh, yeah. I, you know, I saw, like millions of others, I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, the first time they played the Ed Sullivan show. And, <laughs> you know, that stuck a note in me, struck a chord in me, you know, and, and, uh, just watching them play and perform. And then, you know, I dabble. I, I honestly believe that I started dabbling around, even though I didn't have a guitar, with writing right after that, you know, just trying to make words run. And uh, lucky for me, it worked out pretty well. Yeah, I'd say so. You make it you make it sound so simple trying to make words rhyme. I think there's a little more to it than that. You're not giving yourself enough credit there. Um, and I'll get into that in a little in, in a moment here. But I do want to ask you, tell me one of your favorite real life stories behind a song you've written. Mm, Marina Del Rey was real. Uh, nobody in his right mind. A lot of that stuff came, you know, when I had been a couple years into this, making a living at it, you know, I realized that 
the only real way you're going to know about this stuff is if you live it. Now, that's a blessing and a curse for sure. But uh, I lived it, you know. I, I hung out in bars and got my heart broke a hundred times. You know, all of, the, all of the above, so to speak. Um, but a lot of that was self-inflicted just to get the knowledge out of it, you know, to what it felt like. But, uh, you know, I, I, you know, my thing with, with songwriting is, and why I've been successful, I think, is I've just been tenacious. I never gave up. Uh, when I had the opportunity presented to me with Tom Collins at Pi Gym Music, you know, he demanded that you be in the office from nine to five, five days a week writing songs. And that's what I did. And it wasn't until um, four or five years later that I met Hank Cochran and we, and I figured out, you know, we can ride on a boat just as well we can in a little gray walled room. And, uh, but I was like a mule with blinders on, to be honest with you. It's all I thought about. It got to the point where I talked in rhyme during the course of the conversation. You know, I was just that eat up with it. And, you know, pretty much still am today. It's, and the greatest thing about it, I think, is that I love what I do. You know, I've been blessed with something uh, God gave me when I was born. And the, to be able to do something you absolutely love is, is priceless. You know, I can't imagine getting up and going to a job you hate every day. That would just be the worst for me. But, but songwriting, it's, you know, it's challenging. It is not easy. And a lot of kids come to Nashville and within two years they're going home because they're, you know, they, they just don't give it the time and effort it takes to make it. Well, and one of the things you just said that, that I think is really interesting, you said that you lived this stuff and, and you said some of it was self-inflicted so that you could live this stuff. And when I watched your documentary, Kenny Chesney said, Dean Dillon will make you relive all the bad stuff in your life and all the good stuff in life. And I mean, gosh, songwriting must be a really, really emotional job. Uh, the song, a lot of, a lot of things different that one. I mean, I can only imagine that for instance, had to be incredibly emotional. I think you wrote that with Billy Anderson. Is that right? Mm -hmm. but, I mean, something like that, writing something like that, the two of you, an incredibly emotional song that a lot of people connect with, but reliving Shoot. those moments. How is that, how does a session like that look to you? How's that feel? Um, you know, during the course of writing it, you got to get down raw and real. And, uh, and we did, you know, we had two sessions booked actually a Monday and a Tuesday, Bill and I did, and I'd never met Bill. And, uh, we ate breakfast together Monday morning and then got to my office and he started telling Roger Miller stories and we laughed all day, never got anything done. And then Tuesday morning, um, I said, we got to knuckle down and, 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 and write something. And by noon, I think we had one of the worst songs that either one of us had ever written. And normally I would be gone. But I looked at him, I said, Bill, I can't imagine walking out of this room and not having written a great song with you. And he pulled out a sheet of paper out of his briefcase and it had a bunch of things on it that uh, this person would have done differently in their life. And uh, we took that blueprint, so to speak, and really got down to the nitty gritty with it. And uh, fortunately for us, is a big record with Kenny, Kenny Chesney, nominated for a Grammy. Uh, one of two of my favorite things that I've ever written. great song but it's a darn good song my friend and i'm i'm grateful you wrote it <laughs> you know one of the things that um that i've found I've, when i interview people you know i 
I interview people in a lot of different times in their life. Sometimes it's the worst day of their life. Sometimes it's the best day of their life. And I've noticed that sometimes the worst things in our life lead us to the greatest accomplishments. There's a quote that I really like that says, someday I'll look back and know exactly why this had to happen. And it doesn't make the bad things any, any less bad, but it does, I've found, give them some purpose. So how do you reconcile some of those bad things in your life that have led to some of your greatest accomplishments? You know, they're just building blocks to everything. They're building blocks to character. They're building blocks to strength. Um, you know, the, the hard times or what season you, you know, if every day was a holiday, you know, you wouldn't have very much emotion. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, they're, um, like I said, they're building blocks to the person you are and, and, uh, and the person you want to be, you know. So when you look back at, at, some of your toughest times in your documentary, I think you mentioned something along the lines that you didn't really know where you belonged until you were 10 years old. So um, I think it's fair to say you did, you had, a, you had a tough upbringing. So do you feel like you're in a place now where you look back and you know why these things happened and you've made something of them? What do you feel like when you look back on that stuff? Yeah, because you know I got in touch with my soul at 10 years old. You know, uh, my, my upbringing wasn't horrible by any means, but it wasn't an easy path. Uh, my grandparents raised me till I was five. Uh, my mother had gone north to, uh, to uh, work so she could send money back home to, you know, so we'd have food on the table. Um, my grandfather shot my dad two weeks after I was born um, and he never came back. And I never met him till I was 34. Uh, and only saw him a few times after that. And, uh, and then they moved me, when she remarried, when I was five years old, they moved to Detroit, Michigan. Well, you gotta understand that I was raised by my grandparents with my uncles and aunt, and they were like my brothers and sisters. So when they took me out of that environment and, and, and moved me to Detroit, um, man, you talk about homesick. I cried for days. And then when I was uh, 10 years old, they moved back to Tennessee, finally. And they said, but you can't go. There's not enough room for you. And uh, they took me to Keokie, Virginia, and dropped me off with my stepdad's mother, who was just a wonderful person. I'd never met her before, you know, never had met her. And they dropped me off and left me there for a year. And during that time, I'm like, who in the heck do I belong to? I mean, do, you know, what runs through a 10 year old's mind at the time. And, uh, but I will say this, that upbringing, um, man, did it ever get, get me in touch with me. You know, and I used that heartache and that hardship to write some of the best songs I've ever written in my life. You know, it it really got in touch with me and me in touch with sadness, so to speak. And um, a lot of great things came out of that. A lot of great songs were written from that. Uh, to be able to get in touch with your emotions at such a young age. Um, it definitely uh, had a huge impact on the way I wrote and what I wrote about in my early 20s. Well, I'll tell you this, East Tennessee will sure claim you. You, you, belong, you belong with us, my friend. <laughs> yeah. I, I, think, I think you already know that. Hey, you also, um, you know, I also, one of the things I always find is, I like to say, I'm, I'm sure you've heard this saying a million times, that, that friends are the family you choose. And one of the things I found really striking about your career, both your career and, and your personal life, was that you wrote with, uh, for George Strait a whole lot. And you guys have been called brothers. And I think a lot of times, 
just someone in the public, we, we hear the entertainment industry and we instantly hear a lot of backstabbing and you see those things in tabloids and that sort of thing. But there's a real, from what I've seen, there's a real sense of loyalty between you two and with that relationship and with Kenny Chesney. Is that the case? Oh, absolutely. You know, I, what happened with George was I heard about him in 79 sitting on a porch on Music Row with Frank Dacus, who was the first songwriter I met when I came to Nashville and the first songwriter that that actually uh, took me under his wing and we wrote a lot of songs together. And we're sitting on a porch one day and uh, a guy named Blake Mevis pulls up to the curb in the car, rolls his window down and said, hey, I'm cutting this kid from Texas. Y'all got any songs? Well, you have to understand if, back then and even now if you have a great song you're not wanting to give it to a completely unknown artist that's a big no-no you want to get it to johnny cash or merle haggard or whomever at the time you know and uh but docus and i you know we kind of didn't play by those rules we just wanted songs cut anybody cut our songs and Lucky for us, you know, when uh, Irv Woolsey, who is George Strait's manager, heard Unwound, he told Blake, he said, I don't know the other three songs that you're cutting because they were only going to cut four. He said, I don't know the other three you're doing, but make sure you cut Unwound. And, and uh, they did. And I actually, like I said, nobody would pitch an unknown singer. Their songs... So we wound up with six songs on his first album. And then the second album rolls around and he calls me. And it, he says, meet me in my office at 10 o'clock Monday morning of the week I'm recording. And I did, I sat there across from the table from him and played him, you know, a bunch of songs. And, and uh, he liked a couple of things in and that just got to be the norm. Every Monday of the week he recorded, I was sitting across the table from him playing him songs, and we've done that for 40-some years. You know, and, and, this, and the thing with Kenny, uh, we grew up not that far from each other, albeit I'm a little older than he is. And, and uh, But the first time they asked me to write with him, um, he was signed to the same publishing company Acuff Rose, uh, that I was, and uh, Troy Tomlinson, uh, who was uh, the publisher there at Acuff Rose, said, would you write with Kenny Chesney? And I'm like, well, heck yeah. Well, I didn't know it, but he had been asking him for a couple years, you know, to write with me. And uh, they told him he just wasn't ready yet for whatever that meant. And... Um, but the day we did get together, that morning, he came in my office and he was bouncing off the wall. He was so excited, you know, and I'm standing by a window smoking a cigarette and I yawned real big and stretched my arms out. And, and with my back to, to him, I said, just hold, hold on a minute, Kenny, let me get down to your level. And, and he just, his jaw dropped. And I turned around and busted out laughing and we became friends instantly. And, you know, we've written a ton of songs together. You know, it's same thing with Toby Keith. I think I've written 36 songs with Toby and he's cut them every one. You know, wow. there's just a lot of loyalty there with Toby as there was George because George knew that if I wrote a great song, the first person I was gonna pitch it to would be George Strait. And I did and still do to this day. You know, if I think I've written something great, he's the first person I pitch it to. The, the reason being for that, when I, you know, I came to Nashville to be a singer and a songwriter and a singer too. And I actually had a record deal and at the same time, I was giving George songs for his album. And, you know, I'd put a song out and it'd go to 30. He'd put one out and go to number one. Well, after about five number one records on him, 
you know, I figured it's a heck of a lot easier to write than it is to go out there and beat your brains out on the road without much success. And then we had a meeting one morning where I'd played him 20 some songs. He didn't like anything. And I get up and I got, oh, well, I told him, oh, well, I guess, you know, maybe next time. And as I'm walking out the door, he said, hey, Dean, you've got one song I want to record. And he told me the name of it. And I said, man, that's the first single off my new album. Well, his producer, Tony Brown, looked at me and he said, I'll tell you what, if you let us have that song, I promise you a number one record. And I did the math in my head. You know, I'd spent $30,000 of my songwriting money propping up my uh, a tour that I did the year before, paying my band and hotels and yada, 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 and, and uh, losing money. And uh, I thought for a minute and I looked at George and I said, you can have it. I left that meeting, went to Atlantic, the label that I was recording for, walked into Rick Blackburn's office, who is the president of Atlantic. And I looked at him and I said, stick a fork in me, I'm done. You know, I just want to write songs. So that because, was you know, that was really what I wanted to do. That was where my heart really was, was writing. Because you have all this freedom as a songwriter, you can walk in Walmart and nobody knows who the heck you are. George couldn't do that, you know. Um, and I had young children at the time too, and I wanted to be closer to them, not on the road all the time. And uh, it's worked out wonderfully. So for the, for you know, I've, I've watched them. Um, I've watched my sister try to make it in songwriting. Of course, you know, my brother-in-law has done quite well. and. And then there are, I think your daughter, your daughter's a, a songwriter as well, I, I understand. Killing it right now, just killing it. Well, yeah. and so what would you tell, you and I have obviously seen this, um, and you, you mentioned this a little bit earlier in our interview that some people just don't give it enough time, but there are, it's so saturated in Nashville. And what would you tell the songwriters who are still trying to make it? What would you... What would you tell them? How do they how do they become you? Like I alluded to before, it takes tenacity, never quitting. You know, and, and I think that's where a lot of them, they just give up. They're told no so many times that they believe it. And then, you know, honestly, some of them aren't good enough. You know, you got to understand that there's 120, maybe 120 songwriters in all genres of music making a living at this, in all genres. And it's tough. You know, the, the, you got to get the breaks. Um, you know, obviously my break was meeting George Strait. I mean, I, I couldn't have found a better uh, avenue for my songs than that man. You know, he loved what I did and I loved the way he sang. And that's the reason I quit because he, you know, I could have number one records with him. But you have to find yourself someone who's on the same page you are. Uh, one of the things that a lot of young songwriters don't do that I did and would recommend to anybody writing songs is find someone better than you are, older than you are, that's been there, that's established, uh, you know, and, and, and book those rights with those kind of people. Because I'm telling you what, you know, this generation of songwriter I'm seeing now a 21 year old writing with a 21 year old is going to get you 21 year old songs. You know, I got there, I'm writing with Frank Dyke because he's 15, 20 years older than I am and has already had a couple big hits with Dolly and Porter and uh, was willing to take me under his wing. And then the same thing, everything, 90% of what I know about songwriting, I learned from Hank Cochran. 
I spent four years with him on a boat. He taught me everything he knew about songwriting. He was like a father to me. And we hit it off and had just this wonderful relationship. You know, so finding someone better than you are, riding with someone better than you are, um, you're going to learn, you know. It's like I tell my son. I've got one son that's, that's uh, well, both sons, right, and I'm trying to make it. But the other one, he, one of them, he's, you know, chomping at the bit to do this. And I told him, I said, you know, and, and this is what I think about him. I think if he gets signed to a publishing deal, I'm almost going to bet you within six to 10 months, he'll have written a great song because he's that kind of writer. Now, you know, are he, you, you're the, are you being their older mentor in this? Do you work with them on songwriting? I work with brass. I'll tell you this, Jesse Joe, my daughter, Jesse Joe, you know, wrote song of the year last year. 10,000 hours for Justin Bieber. She's just, you know, uh, we break up in the end. Uh, Cole Swindell and then uh, Mean for Marin or Rich or Mean or whatever that was for Marin Morrison. That she, we took a calculated path with her. And that was, I wrote with her a few times early, early on. And we wrote The Breath You Take with Casey Bethard, number one record. At that point, uh, she had a lot of publishers coming after her, wanting to sign her. And I told her, I said, Jesse, you and I riding together is not going to do you any good because they're going to think you're riding on my coattails. So she went and got with Shane McAnally and um, oh, what's the, I can never remember her name. I will in a minute, but she, you know, uh, uh, Brandy Clark, she went and got with Shane and Brandy and they sat there for a year and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. And that's where Jesse learned how to write commercial songs. It wasn't from me. I mean, we did it a few times early on, like I said, but I didn't want her um, to get, you know, captioned with me as the, as the one writing the songs with her because I knew everybody would think, well, heck, he wrote most of that song. And right. It, you know, it just wasn't the case. And with my son, Brass, I think um, he, I can see me and him. You know, he's, he finally got around to knowing that, you know, this is going to be, if you're going to do this, then you need to put some blinders on and get out into business. And I honestly think within a year's time, he can write a great song. Heck, I've written a couple of great songs with him too, and they were his ideas. And he wrote most of the way he's writing is he writes the songs, brings them to me, and then we sit down together and go back over them. And he's learning from that process too. So you've got, I've, I've, you know, I'm hesitant to ask this next question because I've heard it asked so many times to so many people in the industry, but I think you've got a really unique perspective on this because of your kids and the fact that your kids are going into this industry. So for fear of sounding very cliche with this question, I, we hear all the time that people don't think country music is country music anymore. It's been too infiltrated by pop. These are things that we hear pretty frequently in that industry. So my question to you, your kids are the future of country music. So what is your opinion on, where do you see the future of country music going? Is it is it a good one? Well, unless they stop writing good songs they call great, you know, they need to start writing great songs that are great, not good songs that are they call great. And, and it's like I said before, the problem I've seen with these youngsters, um, they don't want to write with somebody seasoned. They want to write with their buddies from back home or their girlfriend or whatever. And the process to get to greatness takes much, much longer doing that. And um, if I hear one more Lake Bank uh, truck song, you know, I'm going to go out of my ever loving mind. I just, it's just, you know, it's just been diluted 
with uh, rap. And rap, I love rap, but it doesn't belong in country music. Um, that's just my opinion. You know, I'm 65 years old and I'm old and I, I have opinion about that. But, you know, and, and people are right. It's not country anymore. Nine tenths of it isn't. You know, the last great song that I believe I've heard that I thought was absolutely um, just a, an awesome song was The House That Built Me. Oh, that's such a good song. I just thought that song was amazing. And I haven't heard but a few of those since then. You know, I really haven't. And, and um, I don't know where country's going to go, to be honest with you. I really don't. You know, with the, with the, when uh, Stapleton had a hit with Tennessee Whiskey, which never was a single, it was a radio, you know, very few, it didn't, it didn't chart in Billboard or anything uh, as far as a, a, a single release, but it may, had a huge impact. And I thought, you know, if, if uh, this song has this kind of impact, maybe, just maybe, they'll, you know, start uh, trying to write more great music. And um, I don't know. I haven't heard a lot of it lately. I was asked that question last week, and they asked me what I thought about it. I'll tell you like it is, you know. But that, again, that's just my opinion. Does it make you sad? To a degree, yeah. You know, I don't expect it to, get, to go back to the days of Cash and Jones and Haggard. You know, if, if music doesn't evolve, uh, it gets pretty stagnant. Well, his at, it hasn't moved in 10 years. You're hearing the same songs today you heard 10 years ago. You know, when, when the rap thing came to being in country and it's just to me right now it's the most stagnant i've ever i've heard it in my lifetime and uh it's gonna take people writing great music to get it back to to a listenable music to great stuff you know and they're just not doing it they have the capability of doing it you know um they're just not doing it as a whole there are a few out there who are who are changing the game with their stuff. You know, my daughter for one. She's she, Jesse's a lot like me in the sense that she won't sell out. Um, if she does write a song that rhymes, you know, four times in uh, twenty seconds, uh, it's great stuff. You know. And there's just, I'm not hearing a lot of that. Just not hearing a lot of it. You know, I'll give you a good for instance. Why do you think Luke Combs got so big so fast? Because he's Luke Combs, raw and real. He writes great music, you know, and, he, and, and people look at him just like he's one of their buddies, you know, but he writes good, good songs great song and that's why he had you know he puts out a record that goes number one i think he's had five in a row in what a year and a half it's hard to do uh, but he's done it you know because he writes great stuff and uh, that's all i gotta say about that i hear you sounds like it goes back to writing about what you what you lived which is what sounds like yep. you did um yep. And that's the thing it makes it sets him apart. He does write about what he lives. Luke does. One more question for you. Who would you be if you were not Dean Dillon, the songwriter? Oh man, that's a tough question. Um, Dean Dillon, the dad. Yeah, I love my children. I love my wife. I've got one of the greatest wives in the world. Her name's Susie. I'm just a wonderful person. And we love our kids. We got word yesterday we're going to be grandparents again. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That's pretty cool. 
good for you. Congratulations. Are you the are you the fun grandpa? Am I the fun one? Mm -hmm. Are you a fun grandpa? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, I love what playing. They, what do they call you? What's your grandpa name? Grandpa. Grandpa. Yep. Very That's Ca Caroline tagged me with that, my two year old. She couldn't <laughs> say grandpa, she said grandpa. So that, <laughs> that's what I got stuck with. And then Susie's grandma. Oh, those are cute. I think that's sweet. Yeah, that's funny. That's very, very sweet. All right, anything else that I haven't asked you that you'd want to say? Uh, the Hall of Fame deal, you know, it's the pinnacle of what you can do in this business. And I don't, I don't know if people understand um, what it takes to get there. It's not easy by no means. Um, there's a lot of blood, sweat and tears into the people that adorning those walls at the Country Music Hall of Fame. And I, ha I struggle still with do I belong there? And then I, I look back at my life and like I said before, it's all I've ever known. And, you know, the success I've had with it, uh, but just been so blessed with it and so blessed by so many people uh, that, I, that I've uh, been a part of with all these years, you know, so many great songwriters, so many great business people in the music business. Uh, I've been blessed with just and surrounded by with just some wonderful, wonderful people who were uh, kind hearted enough to include me in uh, something that I loved to do. Um, my East Tennessee roots run deep. Um, a lot of people think I'm from Texas and I correct them real quick. You know, I'm an East Tennessee boy. Uh, love it. Love that whole area over there, Knoxville. Uh, Rocky Top, Lake City, formerly Lake City, that just that whole area up there, just gorgeous, beautiful country, and with some of the kindest, most wonderful people in the world.